Hello and welcome to World Health Plus Social Good. I'm Vismita Gupta Smith, and we're coming to you live from the 70th World Health Assembly here in Geneva, Switzerland. We have a jam packed show for you. Today, we're going to bring top public health experts through the set to discuss universal health coverage, health as a human right, health of women and children, neglected tropical diseases, and tuberculosis. So don't forget to send us your questions. On our Facebook live feed, you can directly ask your questions. And on Twitter, don't forget to use the hashtag WHA70 and hashtag social good. Now you'll remember that Tuesday was a very significant day for the World Health Organizations. Member states chose the next Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanam Ghebreyesus, was elected to lead the organization for the next five years. All roads lead to universal health coverage. This will be my central priority. At present, only about half of the world's people have access to health care without impoverishment. This needs to improve dramatically. The path forward is really clear. The Sustainable Development Goals give WHO an opportunity to dramatically increase access to health care. I have also heard from you three clear messages about how WHO does its business. First, you want us to build effective partnerships. You want WHO to be a better partner, but at the same time, lead from front and center, because WHO is the undisputed leader of global health agenda. Dr. Tedros previously served as a Minister of Health Ethiopia from 2005 to 2012. He also served as a Minister of Foreign Affairs Ethiopia from 2012 to 2016 and has served as the chair of the board of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. As Minister of Health, Ethiopia, Dr. Tedros expanded health services across Ethiopia, and that was also mentioned as one of his top priorities uh, in his uh, address. So, as you heard him, universal health coverage, all roads lead to universal health coverage. Now, we know that too many people almost f over 400 million people do not have access to critical health services. In fact, 100 million people are pushed into poverty every year because of their health expenses. Universal health coverage provides access to safe, effective, affordable services without financial risk. But how easy is it to build a health system with universal health coverage? What are the challenges and what do we need to do what do we know works best? Joining us now to explore this is Dr. Delano Dovlo. Dr. Dovlo, you're currently leading WHO's health systems team in our Africa's region. So please tell us about universal health coverage. How would you describe it to someone who has not experienced it? Well, um, I usually describe universal health coverage to people who want to know about it as having access to the most essential services that you need and having that access without obstacles, either cultural, social, or most importantly, financial, uh, to attaining those services. And if those essential services are not available, being able to be referred to a next level where you'll be able to attain those services. And that for me is universal healthcare. And let me also add that that includes not only the curative clinical services, but also health promotion, prevention, and taking care of the disabled uh, so that they have the best uh, possible well-being. So when you say most essential health services, describe to me what are the services that are included, that should be included? Uh, yes. Uh, that's an important question because uh, this essential services will differ depending on the context and the area or the community in which a person lives. And so that needs to be defined by uh, the health services 
uh, as what a person needs as essential. As I said earlier, what is important is first having the health promotion, the, the communication, the awareness, generating the demand for services, people knowing that this is the kind of service that's available and this is what I need. I think it's a primary service. The second one is being able to have uh, the preventive services, the immunizations you need, the medicines you need to take to prevent you from catching disease or other uh, things that might affect your well-being. And thirdly, that when you do fall ill, and usually depending on the community, it could be infectious diseases, it could be non-communicable diseases like uh, diabetes or other uh, ailments, but it could also be issues of mental health, uh, depression, and other things. And you should be able to assess those services. And those are the kinds of things that we do. And we encourage countries to develop what they call the basic package of essential services that should be available to everybody. So Dr. Dovlo, we hear a lot about resilient and strong health systems. What does a health system need to have to deliver universal health coverage as you have described? Yes. I often refer to strong or robust health systems as those that are able, have the, the workforce, the supplies, the processes available in order to deliver the essential services that people need. And, and that is critical. And that they have this without running into shortages or absence of staff or other things that would undermine the reliability of the service and that they are responsive to the populations that need it. In terms of resilience, and that has come up a lot following the Ebola outbreak, that is more about that the services are continuous, even when um, they are challenged by events, by outbreaks, by natural disasters, by other uh, sudden events, that we are able to continue to deliver the most critical services so that people don't die of other things whilst we are trying to meet the challenges that have uh, uh, impacted on our services. And most countries should have a process and mechanisms for ensuring that service continuity continues. Now, Dr. Dovlo, equity has a big role uh, in universal health coverage. How uh, do, do we make our health systems equitable? I think that's uh, a critical part of universal health coverage because if a certain part of our population is unable to reach services, uh, one, it's just not their right, uh, we are not uh, meeting their human rights, and, and secondly, we are all not safe if parts of our population are more vulnerable to disease and other challenges than the rest of us are. And so it's critically important that everybody has these services. And in equity, we mean, again, coming back to what I said in the beginning, the essential services should be available for everybody, what they need. And even for the non-essential ones or things that we can defer, we should have means by which there is a way to finance the services so that everybody can have access to those services, are aware of what gives them good health, and helps them to be able to live the best life possible that they have and particularly in countries where there are inaccessible areas or issues of gender or other things create certain vulnerable groups that we are unable to meet, then we need to make special effort to ensure that people who are marginalized or otherwise uh, get to these services. Dr. Doblo, I want to take some questions from our audience. Uh, Pinky Patel from UN Foundation is tracking audience questions on Facebook and Twitter. Pinky? Thank you, Vesmita. We do have a lot of questions coming in. We have a question from Suraksha from Nepal, who would like to know to what extent have universal health coverage goals been met worldwide? And along with that question is another question from someone in Sudan who is asking about universal health coverage policies in countries in Africa that have been successful and what policies have helped shape those. Very good and important questions, I think. I think on the first part uh, is the issue of um, uh, uh, how we get to uh, uh, universal access. I think what is critical is uh, uh, you need to invest in the distribution of infrastructure, in the distribution of processes, uh, 
ensuring that geographical uh, access is there as a way of ensuring that people do not have major challenges when trying to get to these services. In Africa, what we've tried to do is to look at it in a number of dimensions. One, of course, is the financial dimension. I think at the beginning of this program, the out-of-pocket and catastrophic expenditure was mentioned. Currently, uh, I think the average in our region is about 50% uh, of, uh, of health, total health expenditure comes out of pocket, which is completely um, uh, uh, unreasonable. And so our target is that no more than 20% of, of health expenditure should be the out of pocket. That tells us that we are approaching universal health coverage. Now about 50% of the 47 countries in our region are at around 20% out of pocket. So we are making progress. But even for the 20% out of pocket, we think that is not good enough and will eventually uh, move forward. Where these things have worked, um, uh, to give a couple of examples, uh, there's Ghana, which has uh, a national health insurance scheme uh, that allows the population to prepay and so have a certain access to services. In Rwanda, for example, what they've done is uh, the community-based insurance scheme uh, allows uh, the government to make sure the most poor and vulnerable identified in communities have free access to their services, for example, and that encourages uh, universal access and enhances equity uh, through well-being. Thank you very much, Dr. Doblo, for joining us today. Now, we had an official technical briefing on universal health coverage today just to give you an idea of how important this topic is for WHO and partners. Uh, it's about health as a human, as human rights, um, as a human right. And to describe what that means exactly, I have our next guest, Rajat Khosla head of the Secretariat for High-Level Working Group on Health and Human Rights of Women, Children, and Adolescents, and Dakshita Vikramaratne, member Every Women, Every Child's Independent Accountability Panel, and a woman, Women Delivers Young Leader from Sri Lanka. Welcome, gentlemen. Rajat, let me start with you. Could you please describe to me what does that mean, health as a human right? Thank you. The constitution of World Health Organization starts by describing the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right of all human beings. What this means is that healthcare services, goods and facilities, social determinants of health that are needed by the population are available. What is available must be accessible by all. As a new DG-elect has uh, said as of this morning, health is a human right and everybody should be able to enjoy that right and nobody should die because of their inability to pay or because of living in poverty. So what health as a human right require that healthcare services should be accessible by all, irrespective of their income capacity, irrespective of where they live, what ethnicity or gender they belong to. And it, what it also requires is to ensure that there is quality of services that are available. At the heart of health as a human right lie addressing inequalities and inequities that impair access to healthcare services by populations across the world. And as Dr. Tedros has very clearly said, all roads must lead to universal health coverage, which is a fundamental tool to realize the right to health. Rajat, let's, let's start with maternal deaths. When we talk about a rights-based approach, what does that mean? Every year, it is estimated something around 300,000 women die in childbirth. All these deaths are preventable. Mm -hmm. If you look at the numbers, it's very clear the majority of these deaths happen in low- and middle-income countries. Maternal death, a death of a woman in childbirth, is one of the most stark manifestations of discrimination against women. What rights-based approach to health requires when we look at issues such as maternal or child mortality is to look at the lived realities, is to look at the persons behind these mortality figures. 
is to look at not only the biomedical causes that result in these deaths, but issues such as discrimination, social and gender norms, and other realities that impair women's access to essential healthcare services. So it sounds like gender inequality plays a big role in this, doesn't it? It definitely does play a very important role in this regard. Gender inequality and healthcare, maternal health in particular, have a very intrinsic relationship with each other. These are manifested in different societies around the world in different manner. Child early and forced marriage, female genital mutilation, large numbers of unintended pregnancies are all examples of gender inequality and its impacts on women's health. What it requires is for us to address masculinities and gender stereotypes and ensure that harmful gender norms do not inhibit women's access to life-saving care. Rajat, paint me a picture. Tell, uh, describe to me what are the challenges to health as a human right on the ground. I think the challenges are several, but if I was to encapsulate three fundamental challenges, for me the first one is that health is still not recognized as a fundamental right. In countries around the world, health is looked at it as an aspirational value, not as a fundamental right of population. I think the second big challenge that we have is issues in terms of enabling environments which do not exist in many countries, unfortunately. Legal structures, legal recognition of a health as a human right does not exist in several countries around the world. That is just the fundamental basic that my health, our health, should be recognized as a fundamental human right, but that is not the case in several countries around the world. The final thing is that the budgetary allocation to healthcare remains abysmal around the world. We are confronted with the challenge that whereas the international norms and standards require governments to appropriate uh, at least uh, uh, maximum available resources to healthcare, the allocation because of competing priorities and other constraints tend to be very minimal to health. And together, this limits the advancement of health as a human right. Let me bring in Dakshita at this point. Dakshita, you have served in diff many different roles in this area. When you work in communities, I want to focus on your work in the countries. When you work in communities, which are the populations that have problems accessing health? Uh, the reality is that uh, the people or the communities who need the health care the most are the ones who have the least access to uh, health care. And uh, this is a challenge for different reasons. One could be because of their uh, income situation, uh, especially if you talk about young people. Young people who are unemployed uh, have to pay for their health care and they might not have enough money to pay for it. If the health care is not really accessible or closer to where they are living, they have to pay for transport or for accommodations to access health care. And sometimes because of identities, uh, some of these identities are being restricted by the laws of different countries and it's difficult for people to come out as who they are to access services because they are being discriminated by the healthcare system. And also if you look at... Uh, You're the, talking about uh, communities like the LGBT community, exactly. for instance. Exactly. Young key populations of HIV, which includes LGBT, also uh, people uh, who are part of ethnic minorities, uh, people living in uh, conflict areas and humanitarian settings. Uh, all these people, uh, they might not, they, they need the health care the most because of their vulnerabilities, but still they might not access health services for all these challenges. So how do people like you and partners work on the ground to influence policy to change this? I think ad advocacy plays a great role in terms of relaxing the laws. If we look at really sensitive issues like uh, uh, safe abortion per se, so many laws are really restrictive across the globe for a woman to access uh, safe abortion services. So what we actually do is to work with uh, the policymakers and find entry points in terms of relaxing the laws. Also with regard to LGBT communities, it's very important to make sure that uh, they have access to healthcare services uh, because they have a greater risk of contracting certain diseases. So uh, the laws should be relaxed through advocacy efforts and also uh, need to find different other um, uh, segments to work with, for an example, powerful actors like faith-based leaders or the private sector or celebrities who have a bigger say with regard to working with the governments could be uh, change makers in terms of advocating for policy change. 
So I'm, I'm getting from what you're saying that uh, gender inequalities, uh, the uh, people belonging to the gay and lesbian and transgendered uh, community are facing probably, uh, are among the communities that are facing uh, some of the greatest challenges to access health care. Can you talk about how this is being addressed on the ground uh, by, commun by communities, by governments, by organizations? Takshita, can I start with you? Yeah, uh, so as I said, it's, uh, there's a greater need in terms of uh, relaxing the policies and uh, removing discriminatory laws so that the healthcare systems and healthcare service providers would uh, freely uh, make services available for these populations. But also uh, at the ground level, there's a great need of uh, raising awareness among these people that you know, they have a right to access health services and healthcare. Another way of approaching this could be through school systems to have, for an example, comprehensive sexual education, mm -hmm. which, would, which could play a major role in terms of uh, really giving uh, the whole gamut of information around sexuality for all the uh, children in the schools. Mm -hmm. And that could also include parents and other players uh, within the school setting so that you know, all these people would get an understanding in terms of need of uh, uh, receiving this important information. I want to also talk about uh, rights of the children to access uh, health care and the challenges to it that you see on the ground. Children uh, face compounded challenges uh, in terms of accessing health care on ground from lack of provision for early childhood development related services to services that are needed to make transition from childhood to adolescence and adulthood remain rather precarious in countries around the world. We, we know what works. We know what to do. The challenge is that of implementation mm -hmm. in multiple settings. We have, we have today the evidence which clearly demonstrates is that participatory approaches, bringing children, bringing adolescent voices to policy making, to development of interventions, and to implementation and evaluation of interventions has tangible results. We need to ensure participation of communities in the healthcare decision making that impact their lives, and that includes women, children, and adolescents across the board. We also need to ensure accountability. That should be fundamental to everything that we do, and ensuring that we have transparency in the way interventions are being developed, but also ensuring that we are working proactively to remove stigma and discrimination that often precludes access of population, and especially vulnerable groups, such as children and adolescents around the world in multiple forms. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for making thank the time to join us today. You just heard Rajat and Dakshita describe the challenges that women and children face um, in, in accessing health care. While they they continue to lead uh, in, and work in this area to provide this access. We have actually seen that progress has been made in a different way in the area of health of women and children. On Tuesday, we discussed that more children are making it to their fifth birthday than ever before. In 1990, 12.7 million children died before their fifth birthday. In 2015, it's just under 6 million, a drop of 53%. It's, it is still too many children dying, but it reflects some major changes in the health of children. We have seen some very significant progress in this area, uh, in other areas like maternal and adolescent health. To discuss this with me, I have here with me Katya Everson, President and CEO of Women Deliver. Uh, welcome, Katya. Thank you very much. So, we seem to have made a lot of progress in, uh, in preventing child deaths before their fifth birthday. We're now also looking at adolescent health and their needs. Describe to me what these needs are and what are the challenges to these adolescents. It's so good that focus is now also on adolescents, a forgotten group for the longest time. Imagine being you know, a young girl, a young woman. One of the leading causes of death is dying in childbirth or from pregnancy-related uh, complications. So, you know, taking the prime of their life uh, and dying in what should have been the most beautiful moment. That's the reality today. One of the leading causes is dying in childbirth, and it happens because they are too poor, 
They, it's not a voluntary sex, it's not by choice. They don't have access to, for example, family planning. Uh, they live in too rural, too far away from, um, from, from uh, health care. So that's a reality on the ground right now. But the reality is also, and it's been so wonderful to see this this week, that there's such a much bigger focus on it. We saw it, we'd seen it this week, we saw it last week in Canada where we had the first ever conference on adolescence health, global conference. And we see it in the global strategy for now women's children and adolescent health. That's a roadmap for how we can improve things. So things are in place to really ramp it up. We have also seen uh, a big uh, framework that's come out. It's called the AHA framework, Accelerate Adolescent Health uh, Framework. And we see it in a toolkit that's come out uh, for adolescent health improving advocacy because we need to talk about the issues it doesn't happen just by knowing we have a problem and we have developed women deliver has developed a toolkit together with uh, PMNCH the partnership for maternal newborn child health by young people for young people to really take this forward so Katya it seems to me that young girls Adolescents not having access to reproductive and sexual, uh, uh, you know, healthcare services has so much to do with everything outside of the health uh, sector, right? Um, and now one of the targets for SDGs, for instance, is to by 2030 ensure that they have access to these services. Uh, how are we going to turn this into a reality? Indeed, one of the key issues will be to look at it as an integrated issue. You know, that, that sounds Decode a little wonky, I'll, I'll, you kind of, yeah. but to look at it as a person and not as a body part or a disease or a problem. Mm -hmm. These are young people who are wonderful, have capabilities, but we need to look at it from a health angle, from an education angle, from a water sanitation angle, from an economic perspective, because of course adolescents and adolescent girls are, are all these things. So what's the education level? Can they get to secondary education? We know the correlation there. What's the, about economy? Poverty is, is a great underlying challenge there. So the integration is key and data is key. Today we lack data. Mm. Uh, we have not had the needed uh, age and gender disaggregated data. That actually means we don't count them, mm. we don't listen to them, we don't register what they mean, what they want, and we don't include them. We need to do that. We need to listen to and really include adolescents and young people because if we don't, we, don't, we, we can't do programs and policies mm. that will actually be effective. Right. What we don't measure will not get done. Exactly. Right? And if now, we don't listen to them, we right. don't know what they need. Right. Right. So you've described to me what their needs are. Uh, what are the tools that are available to countries and partners on the ground to provide this access? So we have guidelines, the needed guidelines for health, uh, for, for kind of scaling up adolescent health. We have the global strategy that kind of has, it's a roadmap, it also has details what needs to happen. It's been wonderful to see how the global strategy has embraced both the full sexual and reproductive health and rights of young people, of adolescents, but also the integration, the education, the nutrition, the, un the other aspects. So that's really good. And then we now have that toolkit for, uh, for advocacy and the AHA. So we're on a good path, but of course it doesn't, it's not enough to have it at a global level. We really need to get it out in the hands of the politicians who can make the decision, who can make the investments, and of the young people and adolescents who live and die this. Katya, let me stop there and take some questions from our audience. Pinky? Absolutely. Katya, you have a lot of people very excited to hear about adolescent health and what can be done. I'm hearing questions about, can you speak to some of the ways that we can actually reach and engage adolescents around some of these health issues? And a tag along question from Miriam in Somalia about how we can ensure that adolescents have access to the knowledge, resources, and tools to make decisions in their best interest. Yes. Um, let me just kind of address the how can they be engaged and how can we, we listen. Well, in Women Deliver, we have a young leaders program. We uh, have now 400 young leaders in, uh, from, in more than 100 countries who we, 
we, we work with on training and advocacy, on being able to stand on the big speeches. You've heard some of them here today, Dashkita, others. Um, and really kind of also seek grants on how can they do it and not just talk about it. So that's kind of one way you can engage and scale up. We see other who have the same, but also reaching young people through technology. I know that's not everywhere we can do that, but social is powerful. And we can see that right now. We're actually talking with Mary in Somalia. So she's able to get access. And we see some of the training programs that happens on, on, on digital platforms where we can reach each further. But of course, that doesn't kind of take away the need also for face to face because this is about sex sometimes and it's difficult to fix that over the internet. I know some try but, uh, but, but we really also have to have the human connection. There we have the UN agencies, we have the international and not least the local and community NGOs who play a key role and really peer-to-peer -peer networks where you have safe groups, where you have groups where we can talk about it, where you have groups like the White Ribbon Alliance, where you have some of the groups on the ground in the communities who can really scale it up. Now, every day, 800 women are dying uh, during childbirth, during pregnancy, and most of these deaths are happening in low resource settings, which means that if they had access to these services, we could have saved those lives. Here to talk to me uh, about this is Professor Address Malata, Vice President of International Federation of Midwives and Vice Chancellor, University of Malawi. Welcome. Thank you. Professor Malata, why are these women dying? Women are dying because they don't get the care they, they deserve, and more particularly quality care. Because we have many women in all certain countries that are given the pressure to come into health facilities. When they get to the facility, there are no medicines, there are no midwives, no nurses, many times no doctors. And here we are pushing them to come into our facilities. When they get to the facility, there's no care. I know in the past the issue was they don't come, but today they do come to the health facility, but they don't get quality care, and it is very unfortunate. Many women die in my own country, Malawi. Many women are still dying, and they die because they don't get the care they deserve. If you were to describe some of the biggest risks to their health, how would you uh, describe that, other than what you've just described? Yes, I think many, many issues. When you look at, firstly, access. The issue of access, I've talked about health workforce, I've talked about medicines, but sometimes even transport. The woman would be in that rural area and there's no transport, and I have a personal experience that changed my life. A woman that was told you need to go to the health facility for birth, giving birth, she went to the facility, waited for 48 hours because there was no ambulance to take her to the big hospital because she needed to be helped. She went to the hospital, died on arrival. But when she died, there was an ambulance to take the bo dead body back home. That experience changed my life because how can someone without any illness just give him birth, they have a big baby, they need cesarean birth, they get into a facility and there's no transport. So access is an issue. Many times infrastructure problems, it can be raining, so you'd have an ambulance present but the ambulance can't get to, to where the woman is to get them into the facility. But secondly, I must also say that when they get into the facility, there are delays uh, for them to get care. So there will be many women that need help, and there's maybe just one midwife. So I want to talk about number of midwives, because midwives save lives. Midwives are the highest number of health workforce that can provide care in rural areas. But there's no investment in many countries into midwifery education, if students come into a facility or maybe into a school to learn, there are no resources for learning. And many times they do not, in these programs, don't even use proper standards. So International Confederation of Midwives has got standards. We have guidelines for teaching and, and education of midwives. Many times they come into the schools not following standards and therefore may not have the proper competences that they require so that they can provide care. I also want to talk about the issue of availability of drugs and other resources. So a woman can start bleeding in a facility and then there are no drugs. And what does the midwife do? So the midwife may be willing to give care, but many times they don't have you know, resources for giving that care. I must go back to midwives. Many midwives are overwhelmed, overworked, 
and poorly paid, very low salaries. And what happens is that they would have gone through their education, next you find them in a non-government organization, international organization, because they want better salaries. But at the end of the day, that good midwife with competences is not available to provide care to this particular woman who needs that care. And indeed, many women die. In the past, we were talking about education. But today, I want to focus on not just general education, but girl-child education. If you keep a girl-child in school, you delay their marriage. You delay their getting pregnant. And if they go into university education, you can be assured, perhaps by age 22, 23, they are already you know, able to perhaps get married at that point, but they've gone through education. So we still have many girls out there that haven't gone to school, or they go to school, primary education, they are already being sold for marriage. And it is very unfortunate that even today, girls age 10, age 12, age 14, are getting married, and this has to stop. Right. Yes. And actually, you're absolutely right. I have seen this on, in many scenarios, how dedicated midwives are on the ground. They're working sometimes without pay, without the pay coming on time for months on end, and, and they're still at their jobs. Um, now, Malawi is one of the countries that's leading the charge in yes. providing uh, care to mothers. Yes. Uh, describe to me what is happening on the ground. Yes, on the ground, we, we are now pushing for quality improvement in materno and newborn child health care. So we want every facility in Malawi to look at issues of quality. Women, children, babies, um, their families, when they get into our facilities, we want them to get good care at the right time. And we do not want people to come into the facility to wait for a long time. So we are looking at issues of timing, we are looking at resources, so there's actually a lot of effort now to train and educate more midwives and also other health workers. It's not just midwifery, I'm talking about nurses, I'm talking about pharmacists, every group. We want as many of them to be available so that we can actually have at least every facility in Malawi have adequate number of health workforce. We are also pushing for wash. They have to wash hands. They have to prevent infection because we have People that come into our facilities healthy, perhaps they just need family planning method, perhaps they just need you know, um, counseling, and yet they get out of the facility with infection. So we do not want our clients to come into facilities and get infection in the facility. So we are pushing for WASH, and I want to thank partners that are helping our country with WASH. We are also going beyond WASH. We want to look at data. So we just said about data now from right. Women Delivery. Right. We want to have quality data. So all our programs, all our health professionals are taught how to collect data and how to use the data. It's not just data for uh, agencies that are providing resources. It is also data that can be used to improve care. If you find in your facility women have died because of bleeding, you need to find out why has, have these women been dying. Right. Is it because they came late? Is right. it because they came and they didn't get best care? Right. So we want that data and at every level so that we can improve quality of care. Right, data is so important, right? In so many scenarios, there is no data. Then there's a lot of data, but we don't know what that means. It, it is that whole step from actually collecting the data and using analyzing it, it using it, mm -hmm. To, to help uh, the last person in the line in a remote village somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I, before I take questions from the audience, I want to ask you, uh, Professor Malata, mm -hmm. what, uh, as a midwife, if a community was uh, going to uh, put in place some measures to save women's life during childbirth, what would you advise them? I would advise communities to demand care. So they need to know that they have a right to care. And many times communities don't know. So what happens is they receive anything. So demand is important. They need to say, we demand quality care in this community. So the leaders in the community, traditional leaders, religious leaders, and you know we have even elderly people that don't necessarily have a position but influence the community, should know what they deserve. To me, I think we normally take it for granted they shouldn't know, but if they know, what they deserve, they can demand that care. Right. And secondly, they also need to make sure that there's leadership within their own communities. Who is responsible for that? Nobody should lead for them. Right. I believe, particularly for maternal health issues, for women's issues, that women themselves should be on the table. Right. I've been promoting at every level, 
we should have women speak on their own behalf exactly. rather than another group speaking for them you speak and on their own behalf yes, on many levels on right many levels. in their communities yes. as policy makers yes. to every e level right? even here Women at the young people have a lesson. yes right. yes right. Get, right. Them right. get them on board get them on the table and let them speak they should speak for themselves and demand what they need to get but also i think they can take their governments to task right because governments have to provide that care and certainly they have to be responsible, there has to be accountability, we all know. But at the end of the day, if you really look at a rural community, the issue of, issues of accountability, in my culture, they're already built in what we call Ubuntu. So people know they have to be responsible. But at the end of the day, they should ask their governments to give them what they deserve. And it's not only for Malawi, but every country in the world. Let me take an audience question now, Pinky. There are a lot of excited people about this topic. So I'm gonna go with Ando Robellison's question about in addition to ensuring quality of care, access to care, and availability of medicines, we need to ensure that women are provided care in a respectful manner, which doesn't always happen. So how would you speak to improving respectful maternal care to ensure that women do feel safe and comfortable going to healthcare facilities? Yes, a very important question, and I'm excited because in many countries now, when you look through media, there are always complaints. This midwife said this, this doctor said that, and they did this to me. I think people knowing what they deserve and what their right is is the number one issue. And, and if someone is rude, they should be able to tell that health worker, I cannot take this. But they can only do that if you give them information. So we do not give information to our communities to tell them it is not right. I believe I've taught midwifery for 25 years. I tell my students if they are tired, they can tell the clients, I am tired. I need a small break. And they don't have to force themselves to work. But many times when you sit in a health facility, you can actually see that this particular woman or this particular health worker is a hardworking person. Many times our clients will not complain if you don't give them medicine. If you say good morning, the greeting only is very powerful. A little smile is very powerful. So if you are not able to give medicines to everyone, but you are able to greet them and show them empathy, that you're a smiling nurse, a smiling doctor, a smiling midwife, it makes a whole difference. Now, my emphasis is schools of nursing or schools of medicine should emphasize on respectful care. It is not about technical skills. Many times our clients want care. That caring spirit, what made most of us get into this profession is because we wanted to care for people. And the schools of nursing, schools of medicines have taken out that component. It is now emphasis on you should be able to, to do this particular skill. But I believe personally that any person who gets into health professional um, um, uh, uh, system, you want to become a nurse, you want to become a doctor, you should have that caring within right. you. And care, that's what people... Providing care yes, yes. Uh, while preserving the dignity yes. and, uh, and observing the yes. rights of your uh, patient. Yes. Ladies, I have a feeling this could be the whole show. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions, but uh, we have to move on to our next segment. I yes. want to thank you both for thank joining you. us. Thank you very so much. So you just heard about the challenges that women and children are facing. Um, uh, although that is an area um, the reduction in child and maternal uh, mortality that we've made great strides in. Another area where we've done uh, remarkably well is tuberculosis. TB is one of the oldest known uh, diseases. If you look deep enough in your family history, you will almost certainly find someone who uh, had TB. Um, without early diagnosis and treatment, it can become extremely dangerous, even deadly. But one of the biggest reasons we are concerned is that, because, is that it can spread from person to person through air, and over a year, a person with active TB can infect 10 to 15 people. For people with HIV or an otherwise impaired immune system, nearly all who are infected with TB will die without proper treatment. Among people with a healthy immune system, nearly 45% will die without treatment. 
Joining me now to talk about it is Dr. Mario Reviglioni. Welcome. You're the director of tuberculosis at WHO. Mario, TB is one of the top causes of death globally. Tell me, where is it prevalent and why is it still, still so? Yeah. So indeed, TB is one of the top 10 causes of death uh, globally and probably people don't realize the number one infectious killer that we have in the world nowadays, killing about 1.8 million people per year, which if you calculate is 5,000 a day and by the end of this show will be 200 people dying because of tuberculosis. So it's a, really a major problem. It's a major problem everywhere. There is no single country that has ever eliminated tuberculosis. Uh, the highest rates uh, per capita, when you calculate per capita, is in Africa. You know, that, that's, uh, especially in Southern Africa, where the HIV epidemic has been important. Uh, but the largest numbers are, in fact, those of uh, Asian, big Asian countries, such as India, Indonesia, and China, that are the top in the world in terms of, uh, in terms of number of cases. So it's a real global issue. Now, these are staggering numbers, Mario. Why uh, do we, uh, what makes it difficult for people to access uh, treatment and diagnosis? Well, uh, tuberculosis used to be diagnosed using what we call smear microscopy, meaning you look at the microscope and you find the bacilla. That, that is a fairly imperfect way of diagnosing, but we have today a new tool uh, that is a rapid molecular diagnostic. It allows you to diagnose TB within a matter of two hours, fairly rapidly, and uh, from a laboratory perspective, not that complicated, really. And so uh, the issue here is that of having this type of tools available everywhere they are needed, which is where, uh, unfortunately, um, the problem is. So access now is guaranteed in several countries, but is not uh, all over the place, which is what we are advocating for. And once you get diagnosed, then the problem, the next problem is that of treatment. So tuberculosis gets treated in six months. It's not a pneumonia that you can treat within 10 days. Here you have to treat for six months, and if you have those drug-resistant form of tuberculosis, then you're talking about up to two years. Although now we have a nine-month regimen that we recommend as WHO, which has not yet been widely used. So we are always there. It's an issue of access and of goodwill by governments to put it in place. So Mario, uh, countries and WHO and partners are, uh, are working on these staggering numbers of TB. And now we also hear about drug-resistant TB. How serious is this problem and how are we addressing this? Uh, th that is a real major concern because it's basically for some patients, we are talking 500,000 to 600,000 every year. For them, it's like being in the pre-antibiotic era. So we are in a situation where we don't have drugs that can be used properly for some of these highly resistant forms of tuberculosis. And the number is huge and the number will be growing unless certain measures are put in place. And so what we have been saying to the world is essentially put surveillance system in place, have laboratories that can diagnose rapidly, have treatment in place because these are second line, as we call them, reserve drugs that are more difficult to, to, to buy and uh, difficult to use, they're more toxic. Um, have the rational use of these drugs um, implement infection control measures in hospitals so that you prevent the transmission and do research because we need much better diagnostic than we have today and much better drugs that we have today. Now TB has been described as a disease of poverty. Um, <clears throat> tell me today where is it prevalent? Who are the people who are at most risk? Um, there are vulnerable populations to TB mm. as you rightly said. So uh, the number one factor here is poverty. That is the common denominator. Mm. And so you can look around and see what the uh, determinants of tuberculosis are, and then you go for this poverty, people living in slums, you know, the slum dwellers, uh, people who are malnourished. Uh, but also some other that have uh, medical conditions, like being infected with HIV, very high risk of getting tuberculosis, um, you know, having, uh, um, having other diseases that require the use of steroids, or uh, conditions like that really provoke the disease. In addition, we now know fairly well that uh, diseases like diabetes, like uh, smoking, uh, is not a disease, it's a condition, mm -hmm. alcohol abuse, etc., are all factors that determine tuberculosis. So we have to really focus down on these highly vulnerable populations. Now, the next 18 months are going to be very significant for uh, your work. Describe to me what is going on uh, globally. 
we, we are going to live in a biennium that is unprecedented in political terms for tuberculosis. So in essence, this is the result of neglect, political neglect, I would say, for, for many, many years. Finally, this year, the Russian government, as we will probably hear in a second, the Russian government has decided to hold a, a major, we call it a first global ministerial level conference on tuberculosis in Moscow on 16, 17 November of this year. So we are expecting declarations that will be really uh, to the point and with deliverables that can be concretely put in place. But uh, more importantly, even next year, all of this will be then taken to the UN General Assembly. TB will be the fifth condition, disease, that is going to the UN General Assembly, which tells you something. That means that people are now realizing that we have to do something for this number one killer, infectious killer in the world. Now, I want to talk in a minute about what all of that will mean. Uh, but let me take a question from the audience. Pinky? Yeah, so we're, at, we're hearing a lot of people asking about why the rates of TB are so high and why TB doesn't get more of the funding and political support that it needs. But these are actually, this is the background for this conference in Moscow and for next year UN General Assembly. We realize that from a technical perspective, yes, we don't have the perfect tools, but we could actually do much better than we do if just governments invested, if the private sector invested in research, and so on and so forth. So having now the possibility of raising the issue at that level will be, the, uh, I think, the, the real factor that will accelerate the effort. So at this point, I want to bring in uh, Dr. Teresa Kasayeva, Deputy Minister of Medical Care in the Ministry of Health Care of the Russian Federation. Welcome. Tell me, what is the burden of uh, TB in Russia, and uh, what are the major ways in which the disease spreads there? First of all, using the opportunity of your invitation, uh, let me congratulate and congratulations to the new Director General, Honorable Dr. Tedros Anhanom Ghebreyesus. We are twice proud in Russian Federation that in this historical moment, our Minister of Health, Dr. Veronika Skvartsova, is the President of General Assembly. And also, we are impressed by the moment that TB today is in the focus of, of a sustainable development agenda. So um, we must uh, say that TB is really a problem in the Russian Federation. Mm. We are among high burden countries. Uh, every year, about 78,000 people fell ill in TB, and about 11,000 people uh, dead from TB. Uh, it's really a huge problem for us, uh, but still I can announce another numbers. Uh, for last 10 years, uh, the rate of uh, TB incidence in Russian Federation decreased 35%, and the rate of mortality decreased uh, 65%. Uh, it may happen uh, because of huge efforts, uh, because of great political commitment of our government and president to solve uh, the problem. So uh, we decided uh, to deal with our uh, efforts, to deal with our thoughts and uh, host uh, the global ministerial conference. It will be the first uh, ministerial conference on TB and we expect to write the problem on the new level. So tell me, why is it so important? Uh, so it is important because of burden. As I said, we are among uh, high burden countries. And next moment, we have uh, uh, evident progress in the solving of the problems. And we have uh, good examples. Uh, we have a unique system of prophylactic screening in Russian Federation. And we can uh, deal with our experience with other countries. Another moment, we want to announce uh, that uh, the problem of TB is not only the problem of uh, TB patients and the specialists. It, it is a multi-sectoral problem. Well, so that I, I wanted to um, ask you that going forward, there will also be a high-level uh, UN-level uh, meeting um, on TB. What difference will that make? Uh, to, to the work that you're doing? What are you expecting out of that meeting? So the problem of, of TB, as said Mario and everybody knows, is old problem. Huge efforts of uh, the specialists, uh, uh, millions of deaths, but in spite of it, we are too far from the 
uh, these targets that was announced uh, by the Sustainable Development Goals. So we need to accelerate our efforts and to look to the problem from the another angle. Uh, the main key ideas that we want to announce from the high level of the United Nations General Assembly uh, are the multi-sectoral cooperation involving all the, all the sectors of the economy uh, to the solving of this problem. Another moment is intensification of their research because we indeed have no enough instruments for solving this problem. And of course, uh, Universal coverage is still on the agenda of today. Well, thank you very much, both of you. We look forward to hearing from you in the next 18 months. Thank you for your work and the passion with which you're helping our countries tackle TB. Good luck to you. Um, so we were discussing so far diseases that are household names. But there is another set of diseases, the neglected tropical diseases, that are actually neglected. These are diseases which often have very difficult uh, names. Unfortunately, these are diseases of the imp uh, that are found in impoverished populations in tropical uh, climates. Um, and these are diseases that uh, disfigure, maim, and blind uh, sometimes uh, people who are infected by them. But in the last 10 years, tremendous work has been done to tackle these diseases. I have Dr. Dirk Engels, Director of Neglected Tropical Diseases at WHO, to tell us, to talk to us about this. Uh, Dirk, paint me a picture of neglected tropical diseases. Why are these diseases neglected? Well, first of all, as you already said, they are typical diseases of poor people, poor people in a tropical, who live in tropical uh, environment, but also who live in uh, conditions that favor the transmission of these diseases. That means uh, poor housing, poor uh, environmental hygiene, they live close to their animals, and because of the poor living conditions, there are many vectors, small creatures like insects that transmit uh, diseases. So as they uh, are diseases of these often remote people, they have low visibility. Uh, they are not rated high on national health agendas, and they are especially diseases of forgotten people. So that is why we call them neglected. They are not the diseases, like you said, that affect vast majority of people, but mm -hmm. people in, in pocket. Yeah. Now, what has the work been like in the last 10 years? Where were we, let's say, in 2007, and where are we now? Well, let me take you back a bit earlier than 2007 because the World Health Organization started to work really on these diseases in the early 2000s. Now the classical approach to these diseases was to look per disease and to, to, to implement interventions to control specific diseases. That is what we have changed. We have defined interventions that are effective for many diseases at the same time. Uh, I can give you an example, like you can do large-scale preventive treatment for uh, worms, for instance, all kinds of worms, so that when you regularly treat uh, whole communities or school-aged children, uh, people will not develop the late-stage uh, disease anymore. So that is what we developed, this concept we developed prior to 2007. What changed in 2007 was this was the first time that WHO has convened the international community to seek support to, for large-scale uh, implementation of, of these interventions. That was our first entity partners meeting, which we aspirationally called a turning point. And it has been a turning point because that has triggered support by many constituencies. The private sector who started donated large quantities of medicine that we could uh, uh, provide freely to, to these poor people. Uh, some funding started to come and then mainly 
many development partners that were working on one disease or another have rallied to uh, jointly implement with us these, uh, these integrated uh, interventions. So that has changed. Now, in 2012, WHO, seeing that this progress was good, in 2012, uh, WHO has set very specific and uh, targets that needed to be reached in a given time frame. That is what we call our neglected tropical diseases roadmap. And then the different development partners have decided to rally around what we call the London Declaration. That is a declaration that they all signed in London, committing themselves to supporting WHO to accelerate the implementation for these neglected tropical diseases. And that has been really a game changer in the scaling up of interventions for NTDs. To an extent that we, a month ago, we, we celebrated the uh, five-year anniversary of the NTD roadmap and the London Declaration. And there we could proudly announce that today we are, reaching, we are reaching one billion of poor people with NTD interventions. So Dirk, uh, give us some examples of these diseases, how they are spread, and what role vector control plays in controlling them. Right, well, let me then focus on the uh, vector-borne diseases. And when I say vectors, I mean, I mean mainly insects and actually mainly mosquitoes. So, um, one type of vector, like mosquitoes, can transmit many diseases. And if I have to uh, mention a few, you all know malaria, for instance, but you all have heard in recent years about dengue, chikungunya, Zika virus. All these are diseases that are transmitted by uh, mosquitoes, not always the same mosquitoes, but there are some over, uh, overlappings. Now, why is uh, vector control uh, so important? Because what we've seen in the last few years is that we have been running from one epidemic to the other. And the emphasis was mainly on, rightly so, on trying to respond to the epidemics. But what we've also seen is that over the year, there have been more and more and more frequent epidemics. So it is high time that we do something more preventive and more fundamentally preventive and that we try to contain and, and limit the spread of vectors rather than looking at diseases. And that is exactly the, the, the aim of uh, the discussion that is going to take place towards the end of this week in, in the World Health Assembly. So what we're trying to do is as we did in general for the neglected tropical diseases, define interventions that are effective for a range of vectors. And that goes from very specific interventions like the, the, the judicious use of pesticide to really environmental improvements. For instance, you can improve your house to make it mosquito proof. Uh, urbanization is, is, is a big element in here. I mean, municipalities can uh, through urbanization, limit the spread and, and, and the increase of these uh, mosquitoes. That's a really important point. I want to bring in our next guest at this point to take this conversation further. Dr. Ciro Ugarte, welcome. Dr. Ugarte is the Director of Emergencies in WHO's Americas region. Uh, as uh, Dirk just mentioned, that uh, Zika virus is one of the, uh, is, is uh, one of the diseases and Mosquito seems to be the perfect vector. It, it, tell me about the current situation of Zika in your uh, region. Zika, yes, has been affected the region of the Americas for more than a year now. But fortunately, since November last year, mm -hmm. the number of cases have been decreasing in all the entire region. Mm -hmm. But now we don't have new territories or countries with Zika transmission. Uh, local transmission, but uh, we do have 46 of them already being affected by Zika. Uh, in the last uh, few months, some of the cases have been increasing slightly 
under control, but in South America, some in Central America, and also a very few in the Caribbean. So those cases are fortunately under control, yes, at this moment. Now, uh, Dirk had just started uh, uh, to talk about the role of communities in controlling the mosquito. Uh, tell us about how this, this strategy of vector control, mosquito control, worked in Zika, and what have you seen uh, in terms of empowering the communities to take charge of controlling the mosquito? Well, this is very important because the mosquitoes were there before the communities came. So it is almost impossible to eliminate completely them. But we do have measures in order to control them. So vector control is one of the measures that will prevent Zika, chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, and so on. And the community is, is crucial in that. The community has been participating in these uh, huge uh, efforts from the governments, from the local governments, but to the top level. But they are participating, looking at the places where the breeding sites are, eliminating those breeding sites, right. looking at what are the ways to protect themselves to when, once the mosquito, maybe there are a population of mosquitoes, how they can protect with clothes, with repellents, and others. So the community engagement is crucial in this. And in emergencies, as also Dirk mentioned, uh, there is a huge appetite for doing vector control. Right. Like campaigns. Right. Campaigns are very nice, mm. but they have to be a permanent intervention, right. both from the level of the government and from the level of the community. So the community has to know because that these mosquitoes are all the, the time. Because controlling the mosquito is an everyday task, exactly. right? Exactly. So right. How, how have you seen uh, this community empowerment and engagement? Give us some examples of where you saw this work really well with Zika. Uh, well, in several parts of, of the Americas, the communities have been not only aware of the presence of mosquitoes, but they are particularly in, in areas where there is lack of water. They concentrate some, they have water in containers, so they are now covering the water in containers. They look at where are the mosquitoes, and they, of course, they control that with nets or so, but they are now knowing where they are uh, biting more, and they are trying to reduce the, that one, particularly for the people, for the young people, for the elderly, for the pregnant women, in this case of Zika, that is crucial. Let me stop at this moment and yes. take some questions from our audience, Pinky. So we have people who are curious to know, how does climate change and weather patterns impact vectors like mosquitoes, and does that concern you? Of course, yes. We, we see that the mosquitoes are increasing in terms of the population, both in terms of the temperature. Temperature will change the habitats of mosquitoes, but also because climate change, as I said, reduces in several places the availability of water, the communities need water, and the water is coming, and also the flooding. The flooding will expand the places where the mosquito may, may breed. That's why in the emergency teams, the, the teams that are going to control also are composed by vector control teams, because they want to also to see what is the new environment in order to control them. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, yes. Pinky. Uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but we have one more show tomorrow, and tomorrow we will talk about emergencies, about climate change, air pollution, antimicrobial resistance, and non-communicable diseases. So until tomorrow then, bye-bye.